It's been, it's been uh, six weeks in this passage, and we're not done. We're going to have at least two more, and uh, I don't think I've ever done this, eight messages on two verses. Um, I hope these verses are really getting into your heart, into your mind. Um, we spent, you know, in our preparations unto launch, we spent a lot of time on Matthew chapter 28, and I hope that's a verse, you know, the Great Commission that really lives and resonates in your mind and your heart. Um, we, we spent these time, I, you know, because I think these two verses are so tremendously important. We want them, these words to really live in you. Um, today, we are going to look at the first part. Um, we've been looking at all these other parts, but the first part. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And I want to part... I want to sit on that portion. I am not ashamed. Now, um, it's been announced to you already that this is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and it's a, this is a good day to talk about this subject. Um, are you ashamed of the gospel? You know, it's, it's, uh, this is America, and, um, but America is a very, right now, a very, very embattled country, and um, it is becoming an increasingly unpopular thing and um, not it's not a respected thing in in a lot of circles and you all know that I mean that's the way it is in our city um, to believe in Jesus to believe this is actually a book from God um, that he's the only way to salvation these are offensive things um, in in pockets of our culture and um, especially here in our city and so um, I don't know if we could say we are persecuted I'm not sure if we could say that. That, that. I think that seems like a bit of a too, too, too big of a word um, for what we have to deal with. But I think we could, I, I, it's certainly we have, we have fears and we have things to face um, for being a follower of Jesus um, in this city. But um, we're going to watch a movie later on after this message. And, and um, just to give you a little taste and a feel for what some of our brothers and sisters, the Church of God, what they have to deal with, and um, and I think there is something you know there is there is some there is something rumbling, and, and it's not a good thing in our culture, where um, more and more of our life, the kind of life that you think you might you know America, the place where you know pursuit of happiness and we can get all our dreams. Well, I, I don't know if that's always going to be the case. And, um, and it may not always be the case that we are not so easily free to worship and that some of the things that our brothers and sisters face around the world, literally their lives are in danger. And then, and then in, in some cases, you know, at, at the very least, they become second-class citizens. And uh, that, that may n not be far for us. I'm not trying to be dramatic or trying to scare you, but um, as we wrestle with this, this is, these words are, this is not my opinion. I'm not looking into the culture and go, let's figure this out in the culture. We're, we're trying to follow God's word. And the word says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Are those words, is that, is that true of your life, of your heart? For when you go to work, when you go to school, when you deal with your neighbors, um, are you a person that you could say, I'm not ashamed to be a believer in Jesus and that he is my redeemer? So let's wrestle with that in today's message. Um, part one, I'm going to call, um, is the central altar of your life. I have a question for you. Did you know that there's an altar in your life? And what's in it? the central altar of your life. Part two, not ashamed to show Jesus to others. Um, not ashamed to show Jesus to others. That's a, you know, that's a really important value in our church. And, um, you know, almost cannot <laughs> ever uh, beat that horse enough. But today especially, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I want to ask you to go to a place where you're not ashamed to show Jesus to others. And then part three, um, I want to describe Jesus this way, not ashamed to take on our shame. That's Jesus. That's God. Not ashamed to take on our shame. 
So let's start. Number um, the central altar of life. I want to I want to put it this way. Um, let me ask you a question. That uh, I had this dear friend. Um, his name is Kenny. He's, he was a pastor, and he passed away in a tragic accident a number of years ago. And <laughs> he said, this is this is the kind of pastor he was. Okay, um, he would pastor college students or young adults, and um, if you w- you know would go out to lunch with him, he would look at you and go, "What are your fears?" <laughs> <laughs> the kind of guy who's like, great. I'm like, oh gosh, so sitting with an 18 year old. What are your fears? Okay, and um, and somewhere along the line, one of the questions he'd like to get people to wrestle with was, um, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to die for? That's a really good question. Um, in America, the free country, the prosperous country, where, you know, like, uh, it's like, uh, oh, the power went out. Well, that actually usually didn't happen, but that kind of happened this past week. Um, we're more concerned about things like, uh, oh, you know, the, the internet's not working this afternoon or something like that, right? We don't usually think about that question. What are you willing to die for? What are you willing to die for? That question, I think, will lead you to answer this question I want to ask you. What is at the central altar of your life? Now, you know, what, that's weird. What are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. In America, we live in this very secular culture. And most people think only religious people, they worship. Religious people worship. And, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious. I'm, I'm agnostic. I don't worship anything. And, and, and that, according to the Bible, is false. The human being is fundamentally a spiritual and worshiping creature. Um, what you, there has to be something in your life. So your life, and I'm not talking, it's not, we're not talking brick and mortar here. Your life is effectively a temple. Did you know that? Your life is a temple. And so usually you think of this building. And what exactly is a temple? It's some building, and they worship something there. And in the central, central place of the temple usually is what they call an altar. And that's the place where you either will give your gifts to God or maybe God is supposed to actually be there depending on, on the religion. But um, did you know that regardless of whether you think you are religious or not, you have a temple. Your life is a temple and there's an altar in the middle of it. Something in the middle of it, that is the most, this thing, this reality, or hopefully this reality, is, is what makes your life you. <laughs> it's what makes your life you. And if what's in the middle of it is crumbles, or is shaken, or is threatened, your whole life is in trouble. <laughs> your whole life is in trouble. And you will absolutely sacrifice for what's in that altar. <laughs> um you will absolutely sacrifice for what's on that altar. And um, that, what's at the center of that altar gets to tell you who you are and if you have any worth. So that's the question I'll ask you. What is at the center are, you know, do you notice, and I'll just let you stop, just let's time up for a moment. You're like, gosh, there goes Susan again. Heavy stuff, right? Um, I'm, I, do you, I don't know if you noticed this, but I, I, I ask you this question in so many different ways. I'm just asking you to, in a somewhat different way today. It's really the question of, uh, you know, I'm asking you really who's your God? Huh. Or what is your God? But I'm asking it to you a little bit differently. The altar is the thing that you will, you're going to bow down to this thing. You're going to sacrifice. You're going to give money for this. In this city, um, when you're, you're a teenager, um, not every kid, but a lot of them, it has to do with like getting into a certain school. And they spend extraordinary hours studying, having to get certain, if, if I get this number on this test, then my life is going to be great. So it's not that the test is at the central altar of your life, but that thing is going to make you you. <laughs> it's like, this is, a, this is a thing. And then so... You know, you get a little bit older, it's, it's a, it gets a little bit bigger and other, other different stakes. And if we fail at those places, 
and you feel like the temple is crumbling. That's, that's, that's what's going on. That's what's going on. A lot, I'm just, I'm just like, I, I say this in various different ways. Next time you meet somebody who's either very angry or very depressed, ask yourself this question. Hmm, what's at the central altar of their temple? Ask that question. Well, then ask, have a conversation with them and they might not quite know what that is, but when you can find out the thing that makes them feel like they're nothing, you're, 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 you're there, you're getting there. But another way to get at that question is, what are you willing to die for? <laughs> what are you willing to die for? Um, I don't know if you, you actually remember it. Well, I actually learned this in ninth grade. In ninth grade, you know, it took world history. In world history, they taught you things like the Greeks had different philosophies. And I actually remembered this, that they have this philosophy called um, the Epicureanism. Have you guys ever heard this? Epicureanism, today we don't call it Epicureanism, but it's the same exact thing. We call it hedonism. Hedonism, for some people, means isn't that just about like having sex all the time or something like that because it's about pleasure. No, and actually, I mean, sex is just one piece of it. It's about um, vacations. It's about having a luxurious bedroom. It's having marble in your bathroom. <laughs> Pleasures, right? You know, you, you know, you, you guys look, watch those TV shows where they do all the... Do you, just, we, watch, we watch these TV shows where they get this really ugly house. There's a lot of them, you know, HGTV. And they get a really ugly house and my family watches them and that house is already... This is the dumpy version of their house. It's already better than our house. <laughs> That's how we go. We're like, wow. And then, and then they break this thing down and it's really strange. They all want to have you know, this gorgeous kitchen in the middle, and then they call it flow, and what, what, open concept, isn't that what they call it? You know all that? It's part of Epicureanism. <laughs> That's, you know, it's all part of hedonism. It's a part of pleasure, because you'll come into the house, and it'll all just feel really good. And achieving all those pleasures, is that at the, is that at the altar of your life? That's at the altar of a lot of people's lives, right? And um, so you're going to be in the middle and you're going to receive all these pleasures. And the kids even have a, uh, because who was it? I, I, it was one of the teenagers was telling this to me today. They, they have a new name for it, right? They have a new name for it. The name is YOLO. Is that right? <laughs> God, I'm, I'm not cool. I'm so not cool. But okay, I'm, I'm trying to pick up what the teenagers think because the what the teenagers think it, there's, a good, uh, there's a good sense that whatever is at the altar is being passed down. And so YOLO, what does YOLO mean? I was like, what, what's YOLO? You only live once. Huh. And if you only live once, then you got to get it all. <laughs> you got to get all the experiences. You got to get, you, you have to just put it all out there and get, out, get it all. And so, is that, is that your life? Is that the temple of your life? YOLO, Epicurean. I mean, it's, 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 you notice it's an old God. Whether it's ancient Greek, hedonism, it's an old God. But if that's all there is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this something to you, this is really important. If this is all there is, then your boss or somebody else who's got more power than you could stick it to you. Because if they hold the control of whether you're gonna get that promotion, whether you're going to get that job, whether you're going to get enough money to, you know, redesign your house so you can have open concept and flow, you know, and then you can get that perfect marble countertop. I mean, these aren't bad things. I'm not making, so stop. I'm not making fun of them. Okay. Nobody puts a bad thing at the central altar, <laughs> You put good things at the central altar. So I'm not making fun of any of this stuff. I want a marble countertop. I want open flow. We don't have it in our house. So we watch these shows and then we just sit there and like sin and covet other people. Okay? And so that's what we do. But then we go, okay, that, that was sin. Okay, stop. <laughs> let's just go back to, let's have contentment with what the Lord has given us. But if this is, at, if this is what is at the central altar of your life, you can be threatened. You can be threatened. So let's talk about something real here. You're in the company. 
You go to lunch. You sit down. Co-workers just starts eating. He's Hindu. He doesn't pray. He's an atheist. You know, she doesn't pray. You know, you sit there and go, wait a second, this really simple thing that I've been taught to do is to pray before my meal. We're not talking about preaching to anybody. <laughs> We're not talking about um, inviting them to church. We're just talking about giving thanks to the Lord before you eat. <laughs> and you're going, if I do that, will my boss see me? And then, go, oh, one of those people. <laughs> one of those people. And, um, hmm, I am not ashamed. And um, if you know that your boss or your boss's boss hates Christians, you don't know that your boss or your boss's boss hates Christians, but you're like, it's a good bet one of them does. Right? It's a good bet one of them does. And they hold the keys of promotion, getting laid off. Well, and then so this conversation rolls around. What did you do on Sunday? <laughs> and then here we go. I am not ashamed. <laughs> I am not ashamed. I'm not talking about getting killed. I'm just talking about being a Christian. What's, what's at the central arc? You know, if, if, uh, if what's really, really important to you is a certain success and pleasure of, of, of uh, what you get in, of this world, then that person's going to have really incredible power over you. What you're really saying is pleasure is at the center of your heart. But if the central altar, well, in other words, the central person is Jesus you're going to go back into your life and you're going to meet Jesus and go, sorry, Jesus, I didn't really want to stand up and let everybody know that I'm with you. <laughs> this is what we're talking about here today. Um, I want to quote something. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of giving away a little portion here, but um, we're going to watch a, a, a pastor. Uh, you're going to hear the words about this pastor of a country on the other side of the world where Christians are basically second-class citizens. And he asks in this video, please pray for us. And this is what he asks for. He says, pray for us to persevere. That's persevere in following Jesus. And then these are the words that really caught my attention. No matter the cost. Please pray for us to persevere no matter the cost. And I want to ask you that question. Is that too much to ask? Is that too much to ask of you? Um, can Jesus say to you, I want you to stand up and be counted with me no matter the cost. No matter the cost. Is that too much of Jesus to ask? Is that, is that too serious? It's like, come on, pastor. You know, we just have to kind of, you know, we just have to get through life. That just sounds so reasonable, isn't it? it sounds so reasonable, isn't it? It's only reasonable if we just assume everybody has to get their happy life. That the happy life is getting all the bells and whistles of, of your career and of your money and of your house and your kids getting to have like this great education, etc., etc. The American dream. But maybe that shouldn't be at the center altar of our life. And a bigger question is, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to incur cost? And so no matter what, can you say that? I am not ashamed of Jesus. <laughs> it's big. It's a big question. Okay. Okay. Stop being such a hard-on pastor, okay? Let, let, let's go to part two. Um, I want to ask you, that's part one is the question I want to ask you. Can you just stand up and be counted with Jesus? Regardless. Will you just trust that he's there? And he sees you. When you go back to your room and you're like, nah, you know, and you deny Jesus before your friends or your coworkers or your neighbors, you're going to go back home and you're going to meet, be with Jesus. And he's going to look at you and go, hmm. 
Can you have that conversation with him? That's the first thing I want to ask you. Now today I want to ask you a little separate thing. Are you, think, I want you to think about what this means for your neighbors. You know, we're a church that really wants to care about our neighbors. If we are afraid to let them know that we believe in Jesus, we are afraid to somehow engage a spiritual conversation and ask them, um, hey, what do you know about, do you, you know, like the, the most important thing I have in my life is, well, salvation. What about you? What's at the central art of your, of the temple of your life? Um, and I want to, you to think about this, not just so much at the stakes of you before Jesus, because I, I know that we all get afraid. I get afraid too. Okay, I get afraid too. And all my life, you know, you, you, you have gut checks all the time. But I want you to just, I want to turn this a little bit. That um, they need you, our neighbors need you and me to not be ashamed. They need us to not be ashamed. I want to read you something from a book that I've been enjoying. Um, this book just came out. Uh, the Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life by David Brooks. And David Brooks is a best-selling author. He's a columnist for the New York Times. And I don't know if you know this, but it seems to be that David Brooks has, has, has become a Christian. And secular, he's secular Jewish. At least he used to be secular Jewish, and now he's you know, not secular, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. um, and he's very, very successful and famous and you know, well-to-do. Uh, we, you know, he grew up in secular Jewish background, and um, it's very hard for them to become Christians. And uh, when it started to look like it in the whole, I mean, <laughs> that he was starting to move toward Jesus. I mean, are you kidding? There's all these like stuff came out in the blogosphere <laughs> attacking him and insulting him and all this stuff, okay? But uh, so this is, this is an, it's an, it's an incre incredibly brave book. But um, it's not so much about Jesus. Well, it is about Jesus and he, he's not afraid and he's not ashamed to basically tell you that he, he came to faith in Christ in this book. Um, but he's talking about the problem in our culture where everybody lives this life and it's about, he calls it the I'm free to be me culture. I'm free to be me culture. And um, here is a, here's the, he thinks that the, in the I'm free to be me culture, it seems really great because I get to just decide what I want to do. He doesn't put it this way. I put it this way, that there's a cost to putting yourself into the central altar of you. The temple is about you. Um, but let me just list the four things that he just sees. It's just, it's just happening all around our country. And he thinks they're horrible. And so he's kind of gotten radicalized and um, he's just basically decided to go to war against it. And probably has something to do with the fact that he's probably become a Christian, but I'm not sure. But he was already seriously concerned about it even before he became a Christian. But here are the things that um, all our neighbors are dealing with and maybe you're dealing with. He calls it the loneliness crisis. If there's a temple and you have to be in the center of the temple, there's a big cost. You get lonely. You get lonely. And uh, loneliness is a big part and parcel of why there's a lot of depression in our, cult in our country. Opioid crisis. You guys hear this about this news? Um, it's like uh, it's loneliness which causes hopelessness which just causes slow suicide through opioid addiction. Loneliness crisis. And just pay attention. Pay attention. And um, ask your coworkers or your friends at school who's there for them when things are hard. Ask them. Ask them about their family. A lot of them are going to tell you, my dad's not there anymore or something like that. And that, 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 those are all signals. Loneliness crisis. A second one, distrust. That, that one doesn't take much. There's so much distrust. I'm not just talking about in the politics. Do You just believe and trust that somebody else, when they say this thing for you, that they, they really mean it. A third thing he says, the crisis of meaning. The crisis of meaning. There's a lot of young people, and he's really, I mean, you could tell, there's fury in this book. 
he's livid and, 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 and there's like wrath and anger because he looks at the young people in our country and he just sees them as utterly lost without meaning. And then the fourth one he says is tribalism. And you know how, he de- this is how he defines tribalism. He goes, tribalism seems like it's community, but it's sort of like the evil dark twin of community. Tribalism is when we all gather together, not on the basis of something we love together. You know, like we all love art or we all love the Niners, <laughs> right? Because like, th- that's good. That's like, you know, that's, like, that's a kind of community. But tribalism is based on what we all hate together. I'm with you because we all hate them together, right? And he's, he sees these things, and this is this rampant in our society. And then the other thing he just says is people don't have resources to deal with suffering. So let's just list those. Loneliness, distrust, the crisis of meaning, tribalism, and can't handle suffering. So go to your neighbors, and maybe you. It's actually, well, pastor, that's me. <laughs> I, I can't handle some of those things. It's, it's, we're all weak. But who can pick us up in this? Isn't it not a savior who go down to the bottom broken place and who has forgiven us when we fail? And when we're in the darkness, he lifts us up into his life and his light and his hope and his love. And if that's who we have in our altar, how can we be ashamed of him? Isn't it, as our brother prayed today, we're nervous that we don't get known. And of course, it's not so much that we want to be known, revived church or us, we want Jesus to be known. Because there's just a good bet. Your friend, your neighbor, they're sad because their parents are getting divorced. They're sad because they're getting divorced. They're sad because you don't know it because they don't tell you, but they got a mountain of debt and the house that they're living in, it's very, very nice, but they are drowning in that debt and they may not be living in that very much longer. And then the crumble, it's like, this house made me happy and we were going to have a nice life for other kids. But when all this crumbles, then where will we go? Because their altar is crumbling. And so when we meet them, please don't assume that they will hate you just because you're a Christian or that they will look down on you because you believe in Jesus. You can't assume that just because like we live in a secular culture, everybody around us, everybody around us is going to hate you because you believe in Jesus. And you're, yes, somebody... It's, that's real. I mean, let's not be, let's, you know, I can't lie to you. It's real. You're at work. You may incur cost. You could not get that promotion. At the next layoff, you, it could be you. That's real. But maybe that's not why you're at that job. Maybe in the next cubicle, someone is suicidal. Or someone's kid is suicidal. And they don't know. They could, my Daughter cuts herself. And I can't share that with anybody. But if you will be vulnerable and somewhere in there you will say, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And there you go. You're coming out of the closet. And you're going to pray for them. You're going to pray to Jesus in the name of Jesus for their woundedness, for their need. And maybe that's why you're at that job. Maybe that's why you're at that job. You know, this is like, there's the drama of all, there's the drama of my career. It's, it's like the drama of my success, the drama of my comforts. It's like, that's a really small temple. And it could crash down. But if you live in the temple of God, and Jesus in the center, the whole world can attack that temple, but it will not come down. Do you know that? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus. That's what he says. The church is God's temple and he cannot be defeated. And so your friends and your neighbors, they need that. 
I'm going re- to read to this, this portion, which I just thought was so cool. So this is what David Brooks said. And this is what, one of the things that helped him start to come to faith in Jesus. To anybody who lives in the secular culture, one's first encounter with a joyful, intelligent Christian comes as something of a shock. <laughs> That's kind of like you get a sense of what they, how they, what they think of us, right? One's first encounter with a joyful, intelligent Christian comes as a shock. And he talks about meeting, um, he, you know, he's passed away, but one of the most famous pastors in the world, a guy named John Stott. So he got to personally meet John Stott. And, um, and then he was so stunned by meeting this man. And John Stott, if you ever met him, that guy is not ashamed of Jesus. And this is how he described him. He actually wrote a column, on, this is before he became a Christian. He wrote a, I read this column in the New York Times. He said this, Stott's voice, I wrote, is friendly, courteous, and natural. It is humble and self-critical, but also confident, joyful, and optimistic. Does that sound like a person who's ashamed? Stott's mission is to pierce through all the incrustations and share direct contact with Jesus. Stott says that the central message of the gospel is not the teachings of Jesus, but Jesus himself. That's absolutely right. The words of Jesus take you to the real Jesus. That's what the gospel is. The real God, you know what the gospel really is? It's just Jesus. He's always bringing people back to the concrete reality of Jesus' life and sacrifice. It's about putting on the mind of Christ. So here's the way how he describes it. In Stott, I met someone entirely confident in his faith, yet drawn to paradoxes. Jesus teaches humility, so why does he always talk about himself? It's weird. It is really weird. But did you, does anybody think that Jesus is not humble? <laughs> even, even, the, even the atheists think Jesus is humble. But if you actually read it, you're like, it's kind of weird. He talks about himself. You know, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <laughs> I just quoted Jesus there, okay? But everybody knows he's absolutely humble. What does it mean to gain power through weakness or freedom through obedience? Power through weakness. Freedom through obedience. In Stott, I found a more unapologetic and direct version of Christianity. Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to be saying to us, I'm here because of you, Stott wrote. It is your sin I am bearing, your curse I am suffering, your debt I am paying, your death I am dying. That's the gospel. Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, until we visit a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size. <laughs> He says, like, meeting this guy, Stott, it's, it's just like, it made him start to realize something in his life was not quite enough. And you don't have to be as confident as John Stott. You might be scared. In fact, you probably are. Who has as much boldness as John Stott? I don't. But you can be honest. Is there something I pray for for you? And then they tell you, oh, your father's dying? Well, my father-in-law passed away just a few weeks ago. You know something about what that's like. You could pray. You could pray for them. You could pray for their brother and sister. That's what, you know, that's what I found out. You could pray for their children. You could pray for finances because funerals are expensive. I don't know, all these things. And you can ask that Jesus would be right there, right there. And they'll have a John Stott moment. They'll have a John Stott moment. I want to close a, a message this way. I'll tell you a little story, and I'll tell you a verse, and I'm going to give you the gospel this way. When I was in college, I heard a story from this pastor. He had a young man visit him. He was a senior in college. And this young man said to him, Pastor, um, I was having a conversation with my, um, my, my, my closest friends. You know, I've been living with these guys. For, you know, this is my fourth year living with these guys. These are my closest friends. 
And the other day, one of them said, you're a Christian? This guy grew up in a Christian home, accepted Jesus when he was like in high school or something like this. But um, he says, you're a Christian? Man, I had no idea. Okay. They didn't threaten him. They still liked him. Everything was fine. But this is what happened to him. He had to go talk to somebody about that because he, after that guy said, you're a Christian? He sensed like Jesus was saying to him, nobody knows that you know me. Your, curse, your closest friends have no clue that they, you know me. And he went to this pastor and this pastor said, this young man sat in my office and wept. And wept because he realized he was ashamed of Jesus. And he had clearly failed following Jesus because nobody, his closest friend had no idea. Now let me show you a verse. And this verse is serious business. Okay? So you're like, how is this the gospel? This is like scary part. It's scary, okay? I'm going to warn you. This is from Jesus. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. That's not only in the Bible once. You can, you, there's like the, you know, like this is uh, this the Luke version. There's a Mark version. I remember when I was a teenager and I read those words, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I went to a school, and if you said that you believe in Jesus, everybody thought you were a loser. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people thought you were a loser. And that was in the 80s. I was in the 80s. It's much more intense today. I mean, I, I really feel for our teenagers today. But I remember reading those words and I said, I, I, I can't have Jesus be ashamed of me. So somehow I've got to muster up enough courage <laughs> to let people know I, I actually really stand with Jesus. You know what? That didn't work. I read this verse. It scared the heck out of me. <laughs> and being scared that Jesus would be ashamed of me that wasn't quite enough. I mean, that's pretty serious motivation. And I remember listening to that story of that man, that young man in college, and I was going like, you know, I was looking like, okay, my doormates know that I believe in Jesus, but I was thinking like, but I don't know. I'm not that far off from that guy. I'm not that far off from that guy. Here's what helped me. You keep reading the Bible. Jesus said this before he went to the cross. You keep reading the Bible. So then, the world shows up to put everybody who follows Jesus to shame. In fact, the world shows up to put all Jesus to shame. It's called the cross. They stripped him naked. They humiliated him. They nailed him up. They mocked him. And then those who followed Jesus, in fact, the boldest one of all, a guy named Peter, said, if you will, I'll even die with you. <laughs> I'll even die with you. The toughest one of all. That's what he said. And then, then you read a little further and you find out, this little girl goes, weren't you one of those ones who was with Jesus? And Peter, no. Heck no, bleepity bleep, not me. I'm not with him. At that moment, Peter cannot say what Paul says in Romans chapter one. I am, I was ashamed of Jesus. And then you read, then Jesus is risen. And then he came to Peter. He came to Peter. He had this very interesting conversation. It's toward the back portion of John, in the gospel of John. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And he goes, you know I love you. And then he goes, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> he goes, you know I love you. And then a third time, do you really love me? And you know what he's doing? Peter had been ashamed and denied Jesus three times. And you know what Jesus was doing? He's like saying, 
I'll let you come back to me. Say it now for me, that you love me. This is Jesus. Every time we fail, and we're chicken, and we're ashamed, remember that portion of the Bible. Yeah, I guess he could be ashamed of us, but then, you know, even that shame went on him. The incredible thing is, we deserve the shame that we incur if we are ashamed of the most glorious one. And yet, he said, the shame that is on you went on me. And he forgives us. And he will forgive you. And he'll forgive you. Let that person be at the central altar of your life. And wherever you go, remember, this is your life. Not how successful you are, or how much money you make, or, you know, like, you know, if, if your countertop is, you know, lame, just come over to my house, okay? <laughs> You'll see our, our, your kitchen is probably nicer. Don't worry about it. But your God is the same God I've got, glorious glorious and he loves you and he forgives you stand in front of him all the time and not be ashamed